Hello and welcome back to this series of lectures on calculus. In this lecture I will present some key aspects of the theory behind polar curves. In the previous lecture I talked about polar coordinates and I explained to you how polar coordinates are set up and how they are defined and some of their basic properties. Uh, what we're going to be looking at in this class, in this lecture, is how those polar coordinates are put into action. Why are they useful? So what we're going to be looking at is why look at polar coordinates? Well, it turns out that polar coordinates are very useful to describe curves that have a rotating pattern around the origin. Here we have a little bit of a connection with the geographical idea of a pole. In fact, you see here in front of you a map of Antarctica all around the South Pole. Notice that if I look at the boundary of Antarctica and I follow it all along, then this forms some kind of a curve which is um, just goes all the way around the pole and back up again. Notice that this is not the graph, if I look at that as a curve, is not the graph of a function. Of course, it does not pass the vertical line test. And therefore, as a function, it is difficult to, um, to study. We may want to describe it as a uh, parametric curve, and we're certainly going to do that. That's going to be a big tool that we're going to use. Uh, but it is not a regular function. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using polar coordinates in order to make these curves described in a more uh, easy, more effective way. Um, now, so in order to do that, what we're going to be doing is we're going to start by considering polar functions. So a polar function is simply a function where r, which is the radius, is going to be some function is going to be dependent on theta, which is the angle. Uh, a polar curve, then, is going to be the graph of a polar function. All right, so let's see how that works. So let's say we are in the regular xy plane, but we're thinking of it as a polar uh, plane, so with polar coordinates. So we're going to start um, looking at different values of theta, and we're going to see what that generates through this function f for the radius r. So let's say we start at theta equals 0, and let's say that's the length of that segment that you see there is the value of r corresponding to theta equals 0. That identifies the little blue dot, so I'm going to mark that blue dot down as the first point on my curve. Now what I can do is I can pick another value of theta, so I'm now drawing a little segment with an angle of theta. Corresponding to this new value of theta, my r will have a different value, different length, which will identify a second point. And I can do the same thing for a third value of theta, and a fourth one, and so on. And I can use different values of theta. Each one of these generates a value for the corresponding r. And once I have my r and my theta, this will give me different points. And I can go around, in fact, I can go for more than one uh, loop around the origin, and I can keep drawing uh, numbers as long as my function is defined. And once I have all these numbers and all these points, what I can do is I can join them as I normally do and come up with a curve. So here is we have, a, again, a very abstract uh, example of a polar function where r, the radius, the distance from the origin, is going to be dependent on the angle that we're going to consider. And um, using all of these different uh, angles and corresponding lengths of r, we're going to come up with a bunch of points which we connect into a curve. Now, let me give you some examples of what, what, where and why this can be useful. Well, the obvious example of a curve that wraps around the origin, of course, is the circle around the origin. Let's pick a circle of radius 3. Okay, So it will look like that. Now, I can certainly find the equation of this circle. In fact, it's something you should be very familiar with. A circle with center at the origin and radius 3 will have a Cartesian equation being given by x squared plus y squared equals 3 squared. Fine and dandy. Now, well, how can I do that in polar coordinates, and will it provide me with some kind of advantage? Well, let's think about it. In polar coordinates, what I'm looking at is the set of all points whose distance from the origin is 3. So that is all the points for which r, my radius coordinate, is 3. Well, that's the equation. That's all of it. So as you can see, a circle for a circle, the equation in polar coordinates turns out to be way easier than the one in Cartesian coordinates, even though the one in Cartesian coordinates is not that difficult. Well, what about something a little bit more complicated like a spiral? Okay? So a spiral looks like this. How am I going to describe that spiral in Cartesian coordinates? Well, obviously, this is not a uh, function, so it does not pass the vertical uh, line test. So I cannot describe it as y equals f of something. 
Uh, and in fact, it turns out it's not easy to define it even as a single equation. There is a simple way to describe that spiral, and it is by using parametric uh, functions. So I can in fact write that function as x equals t cosine t and y equals t sine t. Uh, you may want to check on your calculator that that works. And notice that what that does, the sine and the cosine make the x and y alternate between plus and minus 1, and the t in front of it makes them bigger and bigger, and that creates a spiraling effect. Okay. But again, let's think of this in terms of polar coordinates. Well, what we have here is a curve which, as we rotate around the origin, is getting further and further away from the origin. Well, how about r equal theta? See, as theta gets bigger and bigger, so does r. So as I rotate around the origin, the distance from the origin gets bigger and bigger, and my spiral effect again ends up uh, occurring. Now, notice again how simple this equation is as opposed to the Cartesian one. So this is basically the advantage. This is the reason why people have come up with this idea of uh, polar coordinates and therefore polar curves. Okay? Now, there are some important differences, of course, between um, uh, regular functions and polar functions, or regular curves and polar curves. I'm going to mention just a couple of them right now for you to keep in mind, and then we're going to see some more as we move on. One important thing to notice is that the order in which we write down the coordinates in the polar system is actually, when it comes uh, to uh, identifying a function, is opposite to what we normally use for Cartesian functions. What do I mean by that? Well, if I'm using Cartesian coordinates x and y, I usually write y as a function of x. So when I'm writing x and y, and I'm thinking of a curve or a graph, y turns out to be the dependent variable. So the second variable is the dependent variable. x is the independent variable. So it's the first one we write down, and it's the independent one. However, if I'm working with polar coordinates, we write the coordinates by writing r first and theta second, and yet r is the dependent variable and theta is the independent variable. So that's the normal convention. Again, that's uh, the reason why it's done like that is because it works in applications. And so keep in mind that there's that little switch. Not a big deal, but something to keep in mind. The second thing, of course, that vertical line test does not apply to, um, to polar functions. Uh, why? Because we're not going uh, straight horizontally and vertically to the x and the y axis, but we're rotating around the, the pole. And you might think, hmm, maybe there is some kind of a polar uh, test where we uh, draw, instead of drawing vertical lines and making sure that they hit the curve only once, we draw radii from the origin and make sure that they hit only once. But it doesn't work because remember, we can rotate around around the pole as many times as we want, and therefore in a certain direction we may hit the graph as many times as we want. So this test doesn't apply anymore, we just have to be more careful. However, there is a flip side of the coin, a good thing about these polar functions. Uh, again, they, they are useful, but also they provide some pretty, pretty, some pretty pictures, and we're going to see some of those in one of the later lectures. So um, there, there are, again, some things to be careful about, but there is a payback in the fact that the aesthetics of it uh, is going to be quite, uh, quite nice.